So hello everyone. Uh, we have a, we have a very interesting speaker today. Um, Jill, I'll well, just a second. I'll introduce you, and then the time will be yours. And uh, we finish it. I think it's eleven your time. We want some time for uh, questions. So Jill Hickskitten is an associate professor of religious studies at the University of Oklahoma. Her first book, Arguing with Osnat, Gentile Access to Israel's Living God in Jewish Antiquity, was published in Oxford University Press in 2018. And it was awarded the 2020 Lutenschläger Award for Theological Promise. Her second book, The Scriptures Speak for Itself, the Museum of Bible, the Museum of the Bible and the Politics of Interpretation, is written with Cave and Conkenon. On Canon is currently in production at the Cambridge University Press. Other than that, she was a 2018 recipient of the Society of Biblical Literature Regional Scholar Award and has served as a Humanities Forum Fellow, a Reser Innovative Teaching Fellow, and Honors College Presidential Teaching Fellow at the University of Oklahoma. And as you know, the title of today's lec lecture is Who Owns the Bible? Judaism and Christianity at DC's Museum of the Bible. Is yours too. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me today. I was um, delighted that Mikal suggested me. And, um, and also, I need to confess that I changed the topic of this presentation within the last week. And I'm just so grateful that you indulged me on the time, but also the topic. Um, so I have a, a formal presentation with lots of pictures because when you're studying a museum, it's helpful to have the visuals. Um, and then I'm really looking forward to conversation afterwards. So let me pull my screen up. And let me confess that I have a hard time um, keeping up with the chat on Zoom when I am sharing my screen. So if there is something in the chat that, that um, I need to, to pay attention to. If somebody would just un unmute yourself and you know holler at me, that would be great. All right, so um, the title of this talk is Who Owns the Bible? Judaism and Christianity at the Museum of the Bible. This is an institution that I have been researching and thinking about for several years now, um, in part because I have an ethical interest in how Christians represent and think about Judaism. And, um, and so I, I see this as related to the topic of center and periphery, particularly related to um, interreligious encounters, because this is an institution um, that, that presents itself as sort of ecumenical, as they call it, non um, as an institution that represents everybody for whom these texts are significant, um, including Jews and Christians. And so I'm, I'm interested to articulate how this museum presents these religious traditions and the texts that are important to them. So I'm gonna start with the formal presentation. The Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC is a now infamous evangelical Christian institution that opened its doors near the US National Mall in 2017. The institution is a useful one for thinking about the theme of center and periphery when it comes to my home field of biblical studies, and particularly when it comes to interreligious encounters. This is because the Museum of the Bible presents itself as representing all religious traditions for whom biblical texts are important without centering any one perspective. I can't help but think about this installation though, as a succinct visual of how Protestantism is actually centered. What I wanna to do today is walk us through the remainder of this exhibit floor, which is called History of the Bible, as a way of explicating how the museum centers Christianity at the expense of Judaism. First, a little bit of background. Oops, go back. As Britt Nongbri, Roberta Matza, Morag Crystal, Candida Moss, Joel Baden, and others have shown, the Green family, the folks who founded and funded this white evangelical institution, and people in their employ engaged in myriad illegal activities to build their collection. A collection that came to include not only illegally acquired and imported artifacts, but also Dead Sea Scrolls, later proven to be modern forgeries. 
This is a screenshot from the proofs of this book that is forthcoming that I've co-authored with Kevin Kincannon, in which we focus principally not on the provenance of the museum's artifacts, but on the provenance of the museum itself as a moneyed institution built by white evangelicals in the US as a way of advancing a constellation of political causes. You can see here that from inside the museum, it overlooks the US Capitol on the National Mall in DC. We focus attention on how the artifacts are put to use in the museum exhibits in support of larger and often implicit narratives of the past. We are particularly interested in how Christianity and Judaism are represented in relationship to one another and in how the shared scriptures and diverse scriptural canons are negotiated and presented. This museum's Bible, we argue, writes evangelical Christian insiderness into the cosmos. You can see here a slide that has the organization of the museum's different exhibit floors. There are three permanent exhibits that are have the titles Impact of the Bible, Stories of the Bible, and History of the Bible. So the slides that I'm going to show you today are, are an explication of the history of the Bible floor, so one of the permanent exhibit floors. This is the floor that feels most traditionally historical of the permanent exhibits. Visitors advance through the installation chronologically in time from antiquity forward, encountering the bulk of ancient artifacts and manuscripts on display in the museum. One can wander from cuneiform tablets to a Dead Sea Scroll display, to a feature on the Aleppo Codex, to a series of early printed Bibles, to a Torah scribe who copies the text as onlookers watch. The museum exhibit guides us from the past to the present, but the museum's history is simultaneously and ultimately tracing a divine word from God to humanity. None of the signage, signage makes such an argument explicit, but as I intend to show, the exhibit's themes of technology and transmission only cohere if the history told is not of the Bible made global, but a word, the word, made stable, replicable, and accessible, all concerns that are important to evangelical Christians. The museum's history makes most sense interpreted as an account of a pretextual divine word that transcends the particularity of any physical form, even as it required and still requires human technological innovation to transmit it. Along the way, the museum's history exhibit engages in protectionist strategies to defend- Jill, Jill yeah. excuse yes. me, please. Um, there's a technical problem with your uh, presentation. Oh, is it not showing? It, it's it's strange. I, Partial. We don't see the entire slide. Exactly. We see like we see the entire slide. Maybe may, try ah oh, oh, that now. now okay. Fixed. Now it's okay. okay. It's fixed. Oh, I didn't do anything. That was magic okay. somehow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> this now. is this is your second slide or third slide, right? Because ah yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, so these, these, all right. So this We've is seen the, the, you've seen this one. All right. We That's saw this one. Right. Protestant Bible Next one is it now? And then, right, there's yeah. where you can see now the capital. Now we don't see it well again. It happens again. Can you try and go skip to the next? There we go. Th this is, this is uh, fine. Yeah, maybe, maybe try to close and reopen the. the okay. Let me stop sharing. Close PowerPoint. Reopen it. Thank you for letting me know. I, I first checked with the others on uh, chat and it seemed to be a general problem. Okay. Let's see if this fixes it. So I'm advancing it now. Can you see it? Yes, fine yeah. so far. Right. Uh, okay. Okay, looks good. Fine. Okay. Thank you. The next one. Okay. Okay, wonderful. 
So the, this floor culminates in a celebration of evangelical Christian Bible translation for the purposes of distribution. So that's the sort the tell us that all of this history is moving towards. Really, this floor is as much about the future as it is about the past in the, in the sense that it it is presenting an argument for white evangelical Christian Bible translation and distribution worldwide. The opening placard of the history floor, can y'all see the, the text of the placard now? Yeah. Can see the yes, slide? See okay. It, yes. Okay, great. So here we read the introduction, quote, long ago, before the Bible was gathered into one book, it began as a collection of oral traditions and writings accessible only to a few people. Embraced by many communities with different traditions, the Bible moved from handwritten scrolls to manuscript codices to printed books to mobile devices. Today, the Bible thrives worldwide. How did it grow and spread? This beginning section could have begun in a variety of ways. To follow many mainstream biblical studies, textbooks, and syllabi would likely mean beginning either with the emergence of Israel in Canaan around 1200 BCE or the composite nature of the Pentateuch, the biblical setting, or sorry, another option would have been Sinai, the biblical setting for the giving of God's law to Moses. Most, tr many traditional religious adherents, including the Green family, the founders of this museum, believe the revelation depicted in Exodus and Deuteronomy to have marked the origins of writings that would become biblical. Alternatively, the Museum of the Bible could have followed the lead of the Literalist Creation Museum in Kentucky in the States. Oh, do I not have a slide of that? Oh, there we go. Whose history begins with God's original creation of the world as narrated in the opening chapters of Genesis. And as you can see here, they are also trying to integrate um, how the dinosaurs, uh, how can dinosaurs be integrated into a literalist account of the book of Genesis. The Museum of the Bible's exhibit begins instead with the origins of writing in human history a date assigned 3200 BCE. Visitors are here invited to view ancient cuneiform tablets that represent writing on stone. As biblical scholars, as a biblical scholar whose interest was initially sparked by figuring out how this museum presents biblical origins, which is my field of study, I've puzzled over the curator's choice here given that the folks who produce biblical writings did not originate writing and no biblical literature can be persuasively dated as early as the invention of writing. A museum of the Bible produced video entitled The History of Writing, posted online over a year prior to the museum's opening, connects the origins of cuneiform in Mesopotamia to the biblical character of Abraham. While that video suggested the historicity of Abraham and other mythic patriarchs, the museum exhibit does not make the connection between the origins of writing and the Bible explicit. The curiosity of this choice is worth dwelling on. Why start with cuneiform tablets that do not contain biblical texts or even precursors to biblical texts that were not produced by the people group who wrote the literature now in the Bible or even their contemporary neighbors? Why have visitors engage here with cuneiform tablets whose relationship to the Bible is not self-evident or even directly addressed in signage? This move is best understood once one has moved through the entire history floor and noticed that technologies of textual transmission reign supreme as organizing features of the Bible's movement into and then through various textual media. media. The Museum of the Bible exhibit starts with the invention of writing in human history because this is the technology necessary for the Bible as divine word to move in textual form, which is this is more stable, more replicable, and more reliable than oral transmission. Writing is necessary if one conceives of the Bible as a textualization of God's pretextual message to humans which must become stable enough to be communicated and disseminated. As the signage indicates, writing changed the world. We read here, quote, ancient Mesopotamians used reeds to mark signs on soft clay tablets. At first they created only lists and receipts. 
Soon, however, scribes recorded everything from letters to literature, writing gradually spread through the Fertile Crescent, changing the world forever. From signs marked on clay tablets come more writing systems. Because the biblical writings original languages are Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the focus shifts to those. The placard entitled Egyptian Writing, the beginning of the alphabet, reads, quote, along with trade goods, ancient Near Eastern peoples shared many ideas and technologies. The Egyptian system of writing had a major impact on the region. The world's first alphabet emerged from this cultural exchange. The descendants of this alphabet were used to write Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek the original languages of the Bible. And of course, by including Greek here, they mean the Christian Bible. The museum here has made Mesopotamians and Egyptians the unwitting inventors of biblical textuality, demonstrating a dismissive colonialist optic that instrumentalizes ancient civilizations. This technology is featured because of its necessity for the message's reliability. Without the invention of writing, God's word would be subject to generations of the telephone game in which each retelling changes the original. Writing is here a stabilizer. In later signage discussing voices of the past, we read that scribes played a central role in overcoming the problem of orality. The sign says, quote, across the ancient Near East, writing was an elite skill. Passing on key. Did we have again the problem with the? We have writing. a problem again. Oh, now we um, see it. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, sorry. You see it? Okay. Okay, so I'm reading this sign. The sign says, across the ancient Near East, writing was an elite skill. Passing on key traditions through speech and song was more prominent than it is today. Literary features of some passages in the Hebrew Bible suggest that ancient scribes wrote down stories and poems that previous generations had passed down through spoken words. But the exhibit simultaneously betrays anxiety about the durability of the materials that ancient Israelites and Judahites wrote on. In one placard, we read, quote, the people of Israel and Judah passed on stories, songs, and poetry by word of mouth and through writing, but they wrote on fragile materials and no copies of biblical texts older than the third century BC survive. And I, I will note that the Museum of the Bible uses the Christocentric accounting of time BC and AD rather than what has become more, more customary now BCE and CE. And when I am quoting the, the museum signage, I am quoting what they say. And when I am um, accounting for a time in my own words, I use the more standard BCE and CE. Both oral tradition and fragile writing materials are presented as problems. Neither is durable. Oral tradition is precarious, but so is writing that is subject to the fragility of the papyrus upon which it is inked. The museum contrasts this fragility with durable stone monuments used by nearby cultures that have survived. Writing is insufficient in and of itself. For the museum's history, new technologies are needed that can render the word more durable. The next technological focus is collection. Collecting writings offers otherwise fragile biblical texts a chance to survive and endure through the intentional practice of gathering, combining, and securing. Together with writing, collecting is a stabilizing technology. Analysis of museum signage reveals that collection as a description of the development of the Bible refers to an intentional process of acquisition, curation, and preservation that moves biblical texts into a safe space of care among Jewish communities. As visitors enter the second temple period section of this history, we read how, according to the museum, biblical writings were collected and organized by Jewish communities. A banner called Hebrew Scripture focuses on, quote, preserving traditions and shaping identity. We read, quote, during the second temple period from the late sixth century BC to first century AD, fuller collections of Jewish scripture took shape. They assumed a central role in Jewish religion and culture. Collection here emerges for the first time as a shift in how the word becomes text. The adjective fuller shows that there is a teleology at work. 
we are moving toward the emergence of a full Bible, vocabulary likewise featured on the floor's culminating exhibit called Illuminations to describe a Christian Bible containing Old and New Testaments. The Museum of the Bible virtually ignores that recent historical work on the Second Temple period of Jewish history emphasizes the rich diversity of thinking and practice represented in a wide swath of Jewish scriptures, only some of which eventually became, quote, biblical. The museum's history interprets the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans in 70 as a watershed event only in so much as it impacted the formation of the Christian Bible. According to museum signage, the temple's destruction forced Jewish communities to organize and standardize collections of biblical texts. In an exhibit that visualizes the three different parts of the Tanakh, we find a placard entitled Greek and Roman Rule, Diversity Leads to Stability. I always kind of giggle inside a little bit when I read diversity leads to stability because it just is a sentence that sort of does, does not make sense to me. Um, but it makes sense within the overarching argument that this museum exhibit is making. So the, the temple's destruction by the Romans in 70 here is tied to a push to stabilize the Bible as a monolithic response to trauma. We read that quote, leaders in the surviving Jewish communities work to stabilize their scriptural traditions. On an adjoining sign, we find out how this history conceives the stabilization process to have worked in practice. Quote, before their rebellion against the Romans, most Jews regarded the writings referred to as Torah and the prophets as sacred, but some still questioned which other texts were of the same quality and importance. After the loss of the temple in Jerusalem, a consensus emerged among Jewish communities. This consensus was the threefold organization of the Tanakh. What started out as merely the collection of scriptural writings has now taken on a clear organization and a bounded limit. The signage's invocation of a mysterious some who still questioned what should be in the Bible shows how this history being told is one that continues an inexorable march from precarity to stability from partial to full defined as Christian. A developing technology of collection is what ensures that the word can become the Bible. The next major technological shift comes as the now constituted Tanakh is taken up and transformed into the so-called full Bible by the inclusion of the Christian New Testament. This textual revolution occurs through the introduction of a new material technology, the codex. It is with the codex that the Bible becomes a book, the book of books, but only when it is made so by Christians, according to this museum. In a side alcove off the main thoroughfare of the floor is an exhibit that explains the transition from scroll to codex with examples of each for visitors to touch and manipulate. The technology of the codex transforms the word into a book. Signage reads, the title, the Bible, comes from the Greek words ta biblia, for the books. This reflects the fact that the Bible is actually a compilation of many texts. For centuries, biblical writings appeared on separate scrolls. Starting around the second century AD, use of the new codex, bound book, format allowed multiple texts to be assembled in a single volume. But not everyone agreed on which books should be included in the collections of scripture. Therefore, different collections of what came to be known as the Bible began to appear. Today, different religious traditions that use the Bible still do not agree on exactly which book it contains. While the word has now become a book bound together for the first time, notice what haunts the book. It has not yet become fully stable. The written word is still debated. This word still invokes a judgment of deviance and reveals an anxiety about destabilization. And here we get to, whoops, the, the um, picture that I started with at the beginning of the talk. On this nearby wall are cases containing modern Bibles with different tables of contents. 
Hebrew, Samaritan, Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, and Assyrian. Entitled Book of Books, this exhibit puts a Protestant Bible in the center, flanked by versions that still don't agree with this Bible's full and fixed form. Though chronologically, the visitor at this point is still in the second century CE, these books are all modern editions. Since these are examples of Bibles used by contemporary communities, we should wonder why they are presented here in the past and not at some point later on the floor. Read alongside the signage, this exhibit marks the instability of the Bible's contents as a problem that challenges the promise of the codex form. It will take a few more technological innovations before the Bible can overcome the perceived threat of heterogeneity. The next major technology on this exhibit floor is translation. While the codex holds promise as a vehicle for spread of this word, it can only realize its promise through translation, which allows for texts to circulate across borders. We have to go backwards a few centuries to see where this starts. Next to the Tanakh exhibit, we read, during the Greek and Roman periods, Jews continued to gather their sacred writings. In the third century BC, they began translating these sacred texts from Hebrew into Greek. Christians later inherited these translations and added new books. Biblical writings soon spread throughout the Mediterranean world and beyond, end quote. Translation is here linked to the spread of the Bible. It is a requisite condition for the Bible to become universally accessible, according to this museum. Yet in the logic of the exhibit, for the Bible to spread, it must be decoupled successively from Hebrew and from Jews. First, the museum's history tells us, ancient Jews translate the Tanakh from Hebrew into Greek. According to signage, translation spreads the Bible by following Jews who move around the ancient Mediterranean. But then Christians move in. Christians are said to inherit the Greek translations of the Bible from Jews. As an inheritance, the Bible is here figured as an object of value that was legally transferred to Christians. I can't help but observe that the legal transfer of an inheritance only occurs after the, after the original owner has died. Passing through the museum's exhibit of early Christian papyri, many of which are replicas and not authentic artifacts, visitors enter an exhibit that features early Christian codices in the context of Christian translation. Here we see the codex freed up to cross ethnic and linguistic boundaries. On display are several codices and leaves from codices with biblical texts. These artifacts are tied explicitly to translations that take the Bible to new groups of people, framed interestingly as markets. Signage reads, new audiences need new translations. The Bible was composed in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. As it was carried around the Mediterranean and introduced to new cultures, the text was translated for the ears of new listeners. By AD 600, translations of the Bible existed in at least 10 additional languages." End quote. In some cases, we are told, it was these consumer needs that required the production of new written technology. Christians are credited with inventing the alphabets of Armenian, Georgian, and Gothic for the purposes of translating the Bible. The creation of new alphabets here ties back to the invention of writing as a necessity to textualizing and spreading the word. The process here continues, but now under Christian supervision. From here on out, Jews and their Bibles remain frozen in Hebrew, problematically. In this exhibit, we learn nothing of the complexities of translation, of the messiness of moving between linguistic and cultural systems, nor is there any mention of the multiplicity of versions of biblical texts as these materials proliferate into new contexts. The process unfolds within a narrative of simple information transfer. The Bible is conceived to remain the same as it is translated from one language to the next. Communication is unfettered until new problems emerge. The exhibit suggests that the codex served well as a technology for biblical transmission, but it was hampered by problems caused by its own production. As a handmade object, it was expensive and it was subject to copying errors. 
In signage marked translating the Bible, AD 200 to 1500, we read, quote, as use of the Bible grew, new followers wanted to hear or read it in their own language. Jewish officials worked to preserve the word of God, resulting in precise rules for copying the Hebrew text. Christian leaders' desire for unity and accurate teaching also led to more consistent versions of their Bibles. Translation is still doing what it needs to do as a mechanism of transmission, but it has created a concern for whether these new copies are accurate. The text needs to be stabilized with precise rules for copying. As the exhibits progress through late antiquity and the Middle Ages, we find an increased concern in signage around the stability of the biblical text as, as it is translated and copied. In Latin, Jerome and the Vulgate are presented as important stabilizers. In a sign focused on standardizing the Latin text, we are presented with a problem of diversity leading to instability. Signage reads, quote, unifying the Bible in the West. By the fourth century, Latin, trans Latin translations of the Christian Bible were widely used, but many variations occurred between different copies. This situation created demand for a more reliable edition. End quote. Here we see a contradiction at the heart of the museum's narrative. We have, on the one hand, widespread use of Latin Bibles among Christians, and on the other, an apparent demand. And can uh, Jackie, you need to mute yourself, please. Okay. Okay. You ready? Okay, so here we see a contradiction at the heart of the museum's narrative. We have on the one hand widespread use of Latin Bibles and on the other an apparent demand for a universal edition. With the need for Bibles being met, who was it who demanded a reliable edition? This question is neither addressed nor answered in the exhibit, but it coheres with the overall concern that occupies the exhibit floor. Word made text has to be consistent and stable through time if it's going to be distributed worldwide by evangelical Christians. Jerome's translation of the Bible into Latin is held up as the stabilizing force needed in the West. And then the museum turns to the Masoretes to emphasize how Jews played a role in preserving a stable biblical text. One side reads, quote, the work of the Masoretes, a group of biblical scholars, ensured that all Jewish communities read accurate copies of the Hebrew Bible, end quote. In an interactive exhibit nearby, we are told that there were strict rules that were enforced by Jewish scribes. We read, quote, if there were more than three mistakes in a manuscript, it had to be recopied, end quote. And yet another placard in this corner of the floor, which accompanies a Sephardic Torah scroll on display, suggests that a different Jewish practice could simultaneously threaten the accessibility of biblical texts, that of ceremonially burying decommissioned Torah scrolls in accordance with Jewish law. The artifact in question is a Hebrew manuscript identified as originating in the 1200s in the Iberian Peninsula that has been put together with another manuscript originating in Central Europe in the 19th century. The sign reads, quote, because this extremely early Sephardic scroll was later joined together with a more recent Polish scroll, it was saved from being ceremonially buried or placed in a Geniza. As Candida Moss and Joel Baden have written, such language suggests that Torah scrolls need to be rescued, quote, not from deterioration, but from their traditional Jewish rites, end quote. Even as the Masoretes doing the desired work of standardizing then, the museum represents other Jews as working against the text's accessibility to others because of burying material witnesses to the word. An unwitting visitor could be forgiven for internalizing the museum's message that Jews were ultimately hazardous to the Bible's survival for putting it underground. It's a very disturbing sign. Yet ultimately, the notion of the text's accuracy prevails as the most significant theme in this section. 
Several interactive exhibits work to suggest that biblical copying cannot fail to produce an accurate text, despite the fact that copying by hand often produced variations between texts. Next to the displays of early Christian codices, a touch screen invites visitors. Can y'all see the touch screen with the Greek on it? Did that slide work? No. We actually we can see it partially. Oh, now we see it. Yeah, now we see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this touch screen invites visitors to use a finger to play act scribal practice by copying biblical words. And here you see that this is um, in Greek. The Greek word for light appears in Greek characters and visitors are asked to quote, follow the arrow to copy the phrase below. But what you're really doing here is tracing. The computer does not allow the visitor to copy freehand. The Greek characters are provided in light gray outline on a simulated scrap of paper. The visitor's touch fills them in with black ink. Out of curiosity, when I did this, ex this uh, exhibit, I experimented with whether I could manipulate or mess up the text. The computer ignored my touch when I tried to start from the final letter and trace backwards, when I tried to write a different letter, and when I tried frantically to write anything but what was already given to me. In the end, I copied the text perfectly. The consequence, intended or not, of this interactive exhibit is that the visitor has embodied an imaginary scribe with superhuman powers of accurate transmission. The museum has chosen to assure its audience that just because ancient manuscripts were copied by hand doesn't mean an accurate text could get lost. A further concern marked by the museum is the problem of the Bible's portability and access in the medieval period. In an exhibit marked Practical Groupings that contains manuscripts from the 9th to 10th centuries, we learned that there was not yet a cost-effective technology for the Bible to be in one book. Quote, large manuscripts were expensive, so most Christian biblical codices did not include all the books of the Bible, end quote. Changes in the economy and the introduction of universities increased the demand for Bibles that were not just housed in churches. We read, quote, the changing social context created a need for smaller, less expensive Bibles, end quote. The Bible's accessibility cannot be universal, so the logic goes, if it's too bulky and expensive. Cost has now emerged as a hindrance to the Bible's path to everyone. So too has the dominance of Jerome's Latin Vulgate, somewhat ironically. On a placard entitled Bibles in Local Languages, we read that while Latin was, quote, the universal language of learning, growing numbers of the less educated clamored for access to the Bible in languages they understood, end quote. The signage further emphasizes that translations are needed in order to, quote, increase understanding which is a phrase that assumes that there is a message to be apprehended and comprehended rather than created or constructed. These three problems, the need for new translations, the cost of Bible production, and the risks of hand copying to textual stability are resolved with perhaps the most important textual technology in the museum's story, the printing press. The title of the next major exhibit section is Revolutionary Words, 1400 to 1650. Here we have a double entendre. We've got the Protestant Reformation democratizing Bible reading through vernacular translation, and we've got technological invention of the printing press, making Bibles less expensive to reproduce on a larger scale. The champions of revolutionary words are Erasmus, Martin Luther, and William Tyndale, who are all presented primarily as Bible translators, though this descriptor does not exhaust their activities. In this museum section, the pr printing industry is heralded as the technological means of making the textual Bible accessible to a wider audience. For the museum, Gutenberg's press offers a huge new step forward in transmitting the Bible to the masses. Mirroring the copy like a scribe activity I already described is a complementary interactive for the Gutenberg Bible and the printing press. Print a phrase like Gutenberg, the computer screen beckons. 
The computer screen tells us about the care with which the printer selected and moved each letter to the printing plate. And then we can try our hand at three different phrases from Genesis. Once one is selected, a row of movable plates appears across the lower portion of the screen. On each is a letter. The participant is supposed to move them into the right place with their touch. Above is a template showing which letter should go where. Just as the scribal copying interactive policed visitors touch to ensure accuracy, this computerized system will not allow the participant to accidentally select a letter that should not come next. You cannot help but print the text perfectly. And yet, it was not the case that all Bibles were thereby accurately produced. The museum acknowledges this fascinatingly with two examples of famously inaccurate printings of the King James version of the Bible on display. One is a first edition from six of the King James version from 1611, nicknamed the He Bible because it uses a masculine rather than feminine pronoun in chapter three of the book of Ruth in verse 15. The second is the famous 1631 so-called Wicked Bible, named this way because it contains a misprinting that reversed one of the Ten Commandments. It endorses illicit sexual activity. Thou shall commit adultery, it reads in Exodus 20, 14. The Wicked Bible on display contains a page added after the fact that corrects this error, but these examples of wrong Bibles are ones that here might be described as cute, quaint, or even laughable. They present mistakes in transmission as obvious and easily correctable. So now the printing press has opened up the door to the final stage of the Bible's history as imagined by this museum. By making Bibles cheaper and easier to produce, the press allows the Bible to spread alongside the now central process of translation. But how to get it from Europe into the hands of the people the world over? The next technology needed is a mechanism for this Bible's dissemination. The museum's answer to this logistical problem is, and I kid you not, European colonialism. The expansion of Europe's colonial holdings is presented as a blessing for the Bible and the word it is conceived to contain. A key example of this phenomenon occurs on signage surrounding the King James Bible. Colonialism here appears as a good thing for aid in Bible dissemination. Quote, its literary qualities, along with the British Empire's world dominance, made the King James Bible the most influential and widely read Bible for the next 350 years. From the King James Bible to the work of European Bible societies, Europe's warships and trading vessels would take the Bible around the globe for the first time. The signage for this next phase of the museum's history, Bibles for Everyone, 1750 to 2000, likewise presents European colonialism as a positive mechanism for Bible distribution. One placard reads, quote, Europeans expand the reach of the Bible. European Bible societies are presented as central to the spread of the Bible in the age of European colonialism. The Museum of the Bible's history does not entertain ethical questions that could be raised about the spread of Christianity and the Bible via colonialism. Missing from the museum is any reflection on the fact that Christian missionaries were able to travel around the world with cheap Bibles because they were parasitic on exploitative economic and militaristic networks that facilitated the capture, control, and exploitation of Asia, Africa, and the Americas. As the colonial era gives way to the neoliberal world order, we return to translation. In a sign entitled Continual Translation, New Languages and New Ideas, we read, quote, New advances in biblical scholarship, the discovery of more ancient texts, and the desire to spread the Bible ensured a continual supply of new Bible translations. In the 20th century, the efforts of the American Bible Society, Wycliffe Bible Translators, and the Summer Institute of Linguistics made the United States the hub of translation activity, end quote. With an underlying premise that our world is in a constant state 
need of need for translated Bibles, this sign outlines phenomena that have ensured the success of such a project. The first, new advances in biblical scholarship, erases the possibility that professional research on biblical literature could challenge rather than support the enterprise of Bible translation for purposes of distribution. Bible boosting scholarship here eclipses critical scholarship, which is entirely removed from view for any visitor unfamiliar with the field of biblical studies. Utilizing discovery language that imputes an imperial gaze, the second phenomenon, the discovery of more ancient texts, recasts problems created by the proliferation of variant textual traditions and non-canonical literary works as actually useful for stabilizing a Bible text through translation. So the Bible now has everything it needs to spread its word to the world. Under that celebratory note, visitors find themselves ready to approach the words tell us in the Illuminations exhibit, a celebration of current evangelical Bible translation efforts for purposes of worldwide distribution. The Illuminations Hall is full of physical books. We observe that there is an untold future here on the museum's history that needs interrogating. Given that a major theme of the exhibit floor is developing technologies of transmission, it might have made a fitting in to focus on the effects of the digital revolution on Bible reading and distribution. After all, the Green family is involved with YouVersion, the biggest digital platform for disseminating biblical content via smartphones. Rather than capping off the Museum of the Bible's tracing of transmission technologies, though, this evangelical Christian digital platform appears in a different display on a different floor. Why doesn't it fit in the history exhibit? Let me speculate. Digital Bibles are fundamentally unstable. Their inclusion here would risk challenging the narrative of inherent reliability of the Bible being produced in the museum. Bibles on smartphones do not have the same boundaries as a book. They pose a challenge to the traditional shape and contents of canon, and the museum's history floor goes to great lengths to protect the reliability of this conceived word made text. So this tour of the history floor at the Museum of the Bible, I hope I have persuaded you that this is a centering of not only Protestant Christian conceptions of the Bible, but particularly white evangelical perspectives in the United States in particular with this imperial gaze um, and this uh, like colonialist optic that is desiring Bible distribute Christian Bible distribution worldwide. And in the course of developing this argument on the history floor, Jews and Judaism become instrumentalized um, and also uh, often perceived as a threat to this Christian project of Bible preservation and distribution. I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for hosting me, and I'm really looking forward to conversation. Thank you very much for this uh, critical uh, virtual tour in a museum very far from us and for, for uh, handling the interruptions and the uh, challenges both on the way. And uh, we're hoping for questions. You can, write, you can write on the chat or raise your hand and hope I'll see you. Um, excuse me, Omer. Um, yes. Since the, the the last paragraph was lost, I'm afraid uh, we didn't hear you very well. And maybe you you maybe you could repeat that because I imagine that the last paragraph is is important to you, Jill. Oh dear, I'm sorry about that. I wonder if my internet is unstable. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I was summarizing, I will, I hopefully can remember what I said, was summarizing that um, my, I, I'm, I have argued that this history floor at the Museum of the Bible is actually centering um, not only Protestant, Christian, Euro-American Protestant Christianity, but also white evangelical Christianity in the United States, in as much as it ends in this sort of um, Op colonialist optic or desire for Christian Bible distribution, um, such that all of this history that has been told is for the purpose of this teleological desire, aspiration to spread the Christian Bible. Um, and then along the way, 
um, at Judaism and Jews either get pushed to the periphery of this story um, or are instrumentalized as sort of preservers, even as Jews are also represented really problematically as potential threats to this Christian project of Bible translation and distribution. We have a question from Tirza. Tirza is asking, can you tell us more about the people that come to the museum or the people that the museum would want to, uh, would want to, uh, to host? Yeah, thanks for that question. So this museum, I can't remember if I said this in this talk, but this museum is reportedly has a price tag of a, about a billion dollars. Um, and, so, and this is white evangelical Christian money in the United States. Um, and so the, the stated goal of the museum is to their, their um, tagline or their mission statement is to invite all people to engage with the Bible. Um, and so this is sort of a, it, ha it is encoding this sort of like evangelical Christian language um, of wanting people, all people to come to the museum. Uh, and, uh, and I think that it is, is functionally evangelizing with its conception of, of the Bible. Um, but I will say that, like, I was trained in, in Jewish antiquity. Um, that is my area of expertise. And so I'm not an ethnographer. And so I don't, I didn't interview um, visitors who came to, who come to the museum, but there is an anthropologist named James Bielo who has done a lot of work with interviewing the design firms who were hired to implement or to execute the, the um, exhibits. And uh, he has also done a really fascinating study of there is a Sea of Galilee recreation um, in on the narrative floor. So the floor that's titled narrative of the Bible floor, there's like this panorama that is the Sea of Galilee. And he did a really interesting um, study of people who use who take selfies in front of this fake Sea of Galilee in the capital of the US um, and then tag it interestingly on Instagram. Um, and so, you know, he, he is thinking through like who comes to this museum. Um, but, but I, in my work, focus on like, what are the, what are their aspirations? And um, the, what I find so fascinating is the combination of this ideal of like they, their PR says we are for everybody. Like we have presented the Bible in a non-perspectival way. Like nobody's perspective is centered. Um, and part of what I'm interested in doing in my work is showing that, um, that there is a perspective here and that it's worth articulating because there are ethical concerns about how others are represented in the museum this way. Thanks for that question. I, have a, I actually have one question. It's more of a meta question, but uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is just a, some level of, uh, of conflict, I'd say, between the evangelical institutions and academia. Would be correct to say? So it depends on who you ask. And this is actually something that's so fascinating with the with the evangelical money that is going into this museum, um, because as Candida Moss and, and Joel Baden have written, the Green family has also been funneling money into evangelical um, higher education institutes. And so not only are they acquiring these art of ancient artifacts, um, but they are also sort of parceling them out to Part, scholars that are um, employed at evangelical Christian institutions. And so one of the fascinating things that has happened with the opening of this museum and the field of biblical studies in the United States is that there has been this major fissure um, where those of us who are trained in, in secular scholarship, uh, secular scholarship, are very concerned about this sort of like evangelical Christian knowledge production. Um, and, you know, there is a concern that we don't want our field or the conclusions of historical biblical scholarship to be misrepresented in such a massive scale um, on, you know, it looks like an institute of national public memory because it's on the National Mall with all of the, um, you know, the American War Memorials and the free museums that are federally funded. 
Um, and so it has been sort of um, a very interesting um, set of arguments that have erupted as a result of this museum opening because of that fissure of like, huh, are evangelical Christians sufficiently um, critical enough to be engaged in academia? And the funny thing about biblical studies in, in the US particularly is that there are a lot of institutions that are part of like, um, like um, Southern Baptist institutions of higher education that are actually um, financial contributors to our major academic guild, the Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, and so part of what has been so fascinating for me for this project is sort of tracing where is that money going um, and what kinds of knowledge production is it supporting? But sorry, did you have a follow-up question to that? No, yeah, so I'm very happy that you responded to that because my, my question was that, that uh, just the, a general curiosity, if you can say something about how is it to study something that the subject of your study is, is very close. I mean, there is a... Uh, if, if there's a conflict between the evangelical institutions and academia and you as an academic studying the, and, and criticizing the, uh, the, the same institutions, I mean, I, I imagine it, it raises several questions and uh, I don't know, if you can say just, just thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. So um, part of what's going on with my work is that I teach in the home state of the Green family at the flagship public institution in the state of Oklahoma. And so a lot of my students like go to church where the Greens go to church. Um, and so when I'm teaching um, by the biblical studies or you know, teaching Bible from multiple perspectives that cohere with conclusions of historical biblical scholarship, but also is wanting to introduce um, you know, like feminist and queer readings of the Bible. Um, I, there's a little bit of like a struggle between who can be an authority. Um, and especially as, as a woman um, in a place where the Baptist Christian tradition is very significant, that uh, the Greens are Baptist, that this it's significant here. Um, and there is sort of this very um, <clears throat> patriarchal sense of who can be an authority figure. And so, you know, and also at the same time, this is a tradition that I grew up around and was most familiar with. Uh, and so I see my critiques of the Museum of the Bible as a, a little bit of an internal critique. Um, and that it makes me feel a bit more bold <laughs> because I can see sort of where this came from. And, um, and a lot of times like feel the sense of like where, how it can be harmful for other people. Um, and I hope that I sort of tap into my own identity and institutional affiliations as a way of, um, of, of marking out ways that this, this, this thinking and this use of money can be harmful uh, ideologically. I, I don't know I if that answered your question. There you go. I think it is, and I think many of us can relate to that in our different subjects of studies. Uh, Jackie has some questions. Jackie, do you want to ask the question? Do you want me to read them if you're with us? Ah, oh, sorry, you're mute. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh. Jackie? Okay, I'll read his questions. Two questions. Uh, do any visitors engage engage in ritual practices of bios in, in, intonations of reading verses for family or friends visiting with them. The practice of the museum is similar to practices of poaching if archaeological knowledge uh, if archaeological knowledge to always confirm the Bible. I think there's a few words missing there. Uh, I didn't understand the question. Maybe someone else did. Well, Jackie, I think you can you can unmute yourself, Jackie. Okay. I can go ahead and answer that first question while we get the audio sorted, if you want. Okay. Okay, please. So, um, in the museum on the history 
floor. Um, there's one little room that I did not mention that is sort of off to the side that I have as, as many times as I've been to the museum, have never seen anybody go in this little room, but it feels like a round um, pulpit in a church. Um, and there are Christians reading their Bibles aloud um, in, I think it's in different translations of the Bible so that like visitors can go in there and have this oral experience, but it is Christians reading Christian Bibles um, in, to my knowledge. Um, and then there is also a world, what they call the world stage that is on the, the uh, top floor, I believe of the museum. That is this, um, it's shaped like it's a, it's a room that is shaped like a tabernacle. Um, and they have daily Bible readings there um, where people can experience, have this oral experience. Um, but my impression is that that is also Christians reading the Christian Bible because it sounds very much like a, like a Bible study. Um, and when it comes to like Torah, um, the, the experience of seeing a Jewish person um, working with biblical texts, it's the sofer who is copying. Um, and so it is, a, it is a like visual experience rather than an oral one when it comes to Judaism. Do, do any of them put hands on the screens or pray in the, at the exhibits? I haven't, I haven't observed that, but um, on in the, actually, you know what? I take that back. There are pictures online of um, church groups, for example, getting together and like having worship in a recreation of an ancient synagogue. Um, so like there's an exhibit called the world of Jesus of Nazareth, which is a, is purported to be a recreation of Nazareth village um, in Israel. And, uh, and there are, I have uh, screen capped photos of Christians gathering together with like guitars and to do worship in the recreation of the ancient synagogue. Um, so that, that's actually quite fascinating. And then the part of our, part of our book um, is arguing that that floor of the museum is like inculcating a sense of pilgrimage drawing on, on scholars who have studied Christian pilgrimage, um, that this is sort of like a, um, a chance to, for, it's marketed as a chance for Christians to visit like the center of power of the United States and also a recreation of the Holy Land um, at the same time. Um, and so it is inculcating the sense of pilgrimage, which is, which is religious experience. Uh, and so that's also kind of a fascinating phenomenon that's happening there on that narrative floor. Um, not, not the one that has all of the like signage that you have to read, but it's a floor that engages the senses. Um, there are actually actors who play ancient Jews in the recreation of Nazareth village who work from these scripts that where they're like, um, they will tell you how they built this ancient looking house, the, you know, modern recreation of an ancient house. And then also like somehow, somehow. they work into talking about Jesus. Um, and so it is like kind of a, a surreal experience to go in as somebody who is not wanting to engage in that kind of pilgrimage, but it is, it is certainly um, inculcating the sort of longing for Jesus uh, on this floor. We have a question from Davidi and then Daniela. Anna, do you want to go first? I'm fine. Or I'll go. Okay, I'll go. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks very much for, for the very interesting talk. Um, you were talking about two two parts or two sides of the story, the Jewish and the Christian one. And and what about Muslims? Like the they have they have for the lesser degree, they have something to do with biblical characters. And I guess because your, your, your very interesting tour reminded me a similar museum in Jerusalem called the Friends of Zion Museum, which tells, which is a, an evangelical uh, museum, which tells a biblical story about the land of Israel from the biblical uh, tribes to the temple, to the destruction, and then to Zionism. 
which is demonstrated as, which is presented as, as a Christian story. Uh, that the Christian friends of Zionism came and helped Jews who reestablished their ancient uh, state in, in, the, in the biblical uh, land of Israel. And in, in the Friends of Zion you, you, Museum, you can see that Jewish and Christian uh, attitude towards the uh, Bible um, cooperate which, with, with each other and comes to handy with the sovereignty and, and the modern uh, aspirations towards the land and towards the Bible. And I would be happy to hear what's, what's, if Muslims have any, any, any thing to do with this museum that you talk about, and if not, why? Yeah, it's such a good question, and and thank you for um, relating it to the to the other institution um, there. So the Greens, I I will say, are um, pretty well known for Christian Zionism, um, and the Museum of the Bible has been financially tied with an organization called Passages that runs um, Christian centered um, Zionist Holy Land tours. Um, and so that is definitely something that is that is going on with this museum, that sort of, of ideological um, bent and, and political involvement. And the question about Muslims, like there is what, and this is something that was pointed out by the very first scholarly work that came out on the Museum of the Bible by Candida Moss and Joel Baden, um, where they predicted that there was going to be sort of this fetishization of Jews and Judaism. Um, because of a, an evangelical Christian eschatology, um, where there is sort of like expectation of the rebuilding of the temple and so forth, um, that will usher in the Christian conception of the end times, right, or like the return of Jesus. And so they, um, and then later on social media, they posted, and this is still the case at the museum from the last time I was there, there was one placard um, that says something along the lines of like the biblical characters are uh, important to is or become important in Islam as well. Um, but there's nothing to, there's no like artifact that illustrates it. It's just a placard on the back of a like random pillar. And it's in that it's, it's adjacent to where the, the book of books exhibit is that has the Protestant Bible in the center. And then the only other, the only other mention that I um, have picked up on in the museum is in the narrative floor, there is what they call a Hebrew Bible walkthrough experience. Um, and it is like a 30 to 45 minute ambulatory um, audio visual experience with like um, retractable walls and theatrical smoke. And it is like, it has won design awards for its immersive um, museum, for, like immersive museum exhibit awards. So in that, within that experience, there is a place where you sit and you listen to, or you see on a screen and you listen to a version of the story of Abraham. And, um, and it set, the narrator says something along the lines of, um, Abraham had two sons, but this story follows the story of Isaac. Yeah, so... Um, and I don't think, I can't remember whether Ishmael is named, but there is sort of this, this gesture to like, there's another tradition that exists, but we are not telling that story. Um, and you know that it makes sense when thinking about what the, what the goal is here ultimately for Bible boosterism, Bible distribution, um, the since the Christian Bible like includes shared scriptures, Judaism and Jews can't be ignored in this this ideological framework, um, and but but Islam can be framed as a competitor, as a threat, um, and so there I think that they had some some pressure to like for, from scholars who were saying like if you actually are going to represent everyone, if you actually are going to have like a scholarly secular representation of the Bible, then you can't ignore Islam. Um, and so those were, I, my perception is that those were sort of like quick fixes, band-aids to, to address that concern, um, but that nobody really, uh, no critics actually feel satisfied by that solution. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.
Thank you very much. Is there still one earlier? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Jill, for, for the talk and also for positioning yourself. Um, because I, I, I was wondering all the time if, uh, you know, if this hypercritical uh, attitude, if, if there was a, a, another, po a different possibility, because it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you know, the, this, the, the, the hypercritical approach very much ties into put identity politics in, in the U.S. today, right? And the polarization between, it was, it was very obvious to me. And I was trying to, you know, try and, and uh, sort of free myself from, and, and look at it with more naive eyes. And I'm asking you if it's possible, you know, if an alternative, a, a more, um, a, it's a more sort of uh, forgiving approach to some of the, of the, or less, maybe tendential reading of, of, but correct me if I'm wrong. It, I, and to, to know a little bit more, I would like, it, I'd like you to tell us what happens on other floors. If, if um, do we, you, you said something uh, at, during the Q&A about the, the presenting of ritual, uh, that the enga actual engagement with, with the Bible in, in different traditions or perhaps in different historical periods, do we have anything about the biblical stories? and about biblical figures, about art that is inspired by the Bible or music that um, musical uh, a, a performance of, uh, of uh, psalms or whatever. So I'd like to, to know a little bit more in order to put into proportion perhaps the, 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 the historical narrative as you had presented it. And also, do I, I, I tend to find the angle chosen here to to um, um, a, tell the story as from the material, a, the, put a, an emphasis on the materiality of the Bible, right? On the writing, on the uh, material, on the codex, uh, as actually as a way to uh, neutralize perhaps um, more ideological or or more um, theological perspective. So. It, I, I find it to be sort of a more secular approach, perhaps, that the, uh, than, um, than otherwise. Um, so um, I, I'd be happy to, to uh, hear from you if you can see it slightly in a different manner as well. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, as long as I have been um, thinking about and presenting on the museum, so some people ask me like, why are you so mad? <laughs> um, and it, in my in my mind, I'm doing analysis. Um, and but it is the case that my analysis comes from or not comes from, but is connected to my own sense of advocacy um, that like ideas have consequences and um, and that we are responsible for um, thinking about the consequences of our ideologies. Um, and I, I in particular think that a lot of the uh, I'm even scholarly work that has been done lately on white evangelicalism in the United States, um, I, I see this project as sort of joining that chorus of critique. Um, and, uh, and so this is less an argument of like how we should be thinking about the Bible um, and more about like, let's describe what's happening um, when wealthy white evangelicals in the U.S. Uh, become major players and in, in, uh, and arbiters of historical veracity and uh, and the Bible and so forth. So I'm gonna, I'm trying to remember all of your questions. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So yeah, I'm not. I because of my own sense of um, the of of the ideological harms of white evangelicalism in the U.S. I'm not sure that I could. Um, could shift out of a, a frame that is both curious and critical, um, and uh, and so I I leave that that to to others. Though I will I will say that I just did a presentation last month on um, trying to answer the question of like why are so many biblical scholars, including myself, really mad about this institution? And I traced a history of scholarship that showed that like anthropologists and um, the, theater studies scholars and um, scholars in different 
disciplines were treating the museum of the Bible in their publications, not as like an object of ridicule or as a conversation partner in need of correction and so forth, um, but rather as, you know, truly as an object of analysis and that it has been the case that a lot of American biblical scholars have, have um, treated the museum in a very critical manner, including myself. And what I realized is that that's actually in part because of the museum's parent organization's involvement and interference in the practice of our academic field. Um, and so, you know, that it, it sort of um, has, has raised our ire a bit that they are controlling resources and so forth. Um, but I was also reflecting on that this is a, that like our defensiveness or like feeling territorial around um, presenting the Bible to the public, um, it also, that is, is, is also a very like Protestant way of thinking about the Bible. Um, and in as much as like my field has been inflected by Protestantism, you know, like the field of biblical studies um, has long been um, imbricated in, in Euro-American Protestant Protestantism, um, that our defensiveness is also like a mirror of the, pre the historic preoccupations of the guilds of biblical studies. Um, and so it is, your question is so um, spot on to sort of what I'm trying to think through right now, which is um, how can, can the field of biblical studies in, in the US use the museum as an opportunity to deconstruct um, pieces of our own approach to the Bible that is actually harmful. So, you know, for example, I, you know, we, we in the field of biblical studies, we use other people's material objects to tell large, you know, grand meta narratives. Um, we use the modern concept of Bible to then tell history in a way that is teleological. And so some of the things that, that um, American biblical scholars are frustrated at the museum about it's because we are uncomfortable that we have, like our guild has sometimes done the same things. Um, so I find find that question very interesting. And then in terms of like the art and music, yes. So the the impact of the Bible floor, which is the, the third um, exhibit floor is um, aimed at showing how the Bible has been used in art and literature and, uh, and so forth. And there is a hallway that is about the Bible in the United States. And then there is an adjacent hallway that is about the Bible in the world. And, um, and it does, you know, ha it has like the music of Elvis Presley and it has fashion, it has like dresses that um, they, they are presenting as having been influenced by the Bible. And, uh, and there is something called the Joshua machine um, at the end of this floor where, visitors are invited to get into a recording booth and describe and have it recorded how the Bible has impacted them. Um, and so there, that is, is certainly an emphasis of the museum. And the, the, the point is to, for, I think, is to show the ubiquity of biblical influence. Um, and so that could be seen as, you know, in a couple of ways. One is this phrase, biblical literacy. Um, you know, like the, the Greens are big about wanting people to know what's in the Bible because it has been so influential over time. Um, and then, you know, that could also be looked at at another perspective that it's continuing to reinforce the hegemony um, or normalizing the Bible such that people who, who didn't grow up in it um, or who don't know it are actually um, being, you know, disciplined into seeing it as normative. Um, and so that is, you know, as, as in the U.S., we're sort of having a reckoning of, of religious pluralism and, um, and a lot of folks who are, a lot of Christians who are claiming religious freedom um, without recognizing that sort of that and biblical literacy without recognizing that that can be um, a way for the hegemonic to um, control the narrative or to, to discipline other people into thinking the way that they do. So I, I don't know, maybe I'm irredeemably suspicious, um, but I, I think that it's important for me to be thinking about. Uh, Michael Gavison, do you want, want to ask a question? Yeah, 
Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very interesting and the kind of diachronic walkthrough was great. Uh, just a quick follow up, you know, because you, you really hit home the theological thrust of it, the kind of like apologetics and the fixed status of the text. And then you mentioned at the end uh, the potential hesitancy to go into the uh, the mobile world or like the smartphones or things like that. And you said that it may destabilize um, what they're trying to to advocate. If I understood you correctly, there can you can you just expound on that? Do you do you mean like because of like the high resolution photos that are coming out of like ancient texts or yeah? If you could just expound on that, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So this is, um, you You got the argument right on, and it is just making me think that I didn't explain well enough what you version is, or like what I mean by digital Bibles. So um, you version is the name of this digital Bible platform, where you download an app to your smartphone, and you can like look up a Bible verse. So it's not pictures of ancient artifacts it's presentations of English translations of the Bible, or maybe it's more than English as well. It probably is um, so translations of, of the Christian Bible. And um, so the work that has been done on sort of Bibles and the digital revolution have has pointed out, and I'm thinking right now, I'm thinking of um, Brian Bibb and um, and others. They've pointed out that, that with the digital Bible, the, the shape of the canon is not fixed, right? Because like, I can open up you version and I like scroll down to a verse and then it has a hyperlink to another verse. And so I like skip between books of the Bible and um, it, you encounter it, you encounter the material in a very different way than if you have either a scroll or a codex um, because you, the, the way in which you have the material presented to you is in some way determined by the medium in which you are encountering it. And so on the digital, you know, like I could choose, I, I can get to Psalms without ever having to get through Genesis. Like I never have to see Genesis to get anywhere else in, in the digital Bible. Um, and it's easy to include other things that maybe aren't in the like fixed canon list for Christian Bibles. Um, and so there could be like Bible commentaries um, by, by people who, by Christians who are put alongside in the, in the digital platform. So that's what I mean by like the medium sort of, um, the, me the digital medium provides more opportunity for the contents to look different. And you, it's like user, um, the way in which the user interacts with the text is very different than if it's a scroll or a codex. Was that helpful? Yeah, so, so to understand the, the, like that variety that you now have at your fingertips to be able to interact with various different things that could somehow lead to destabilizing um, the text is like a major thrust is like the how it's fixed and you know like the end goal is there. So it works to also destabilize it, you think? So that's just this is my guess. I mean, it was a, a curiosity that that popped into my mind when I was thinking like, huh, technologies organize this floor and yet they stop at the printed book you know like that's not we we've there are other technology technological innovations so why would that be the case like why do they stop with a library of printed books as the final technology um and that was just my guess is that it it would not fit into the larger theme of what technology on the floor is is presented as doing, which is stabilizing. Um, and it's not that they ignore digital Bibles. So this U version, which is an evangelical Christian platform is featured on one floor or two floors down on the impact of the Bible floor. Um, and what they have is this like huge surround, this screen that is like taller than two people. It's like two floors. And um, it is supposedly telling you where in the world at any given point at any given moment, people are looking at which verses of the Bible. And it's they're using U version as the, the entry point into that data. So it's basically like who's accessing U version and what are they reading and where on the globe. And they're using people's cell phones to present that data. Um, and so that was sort of just my hypothesis as to like why is it on the on a different floor. Um, cause I don't think it fits the, the stabilization theme. Um, but I, I'm happy to be argued out of that. If you have other ideas. 
<laughs> oh, this is very interesting. So no, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. We have time for Ariel. I think we have time for one more question. So Ariel, yes. go ahead. Thank you, and, and thank you for the fascinating uh, lecture. Um, I, I, I still wonder about you, your your um, role as a biblical scholar, because as myself, a biblical scholar, I have like no expe expectations. Like I know no one cares about what biblical scholars say and Jewish or, or Christian culture. And what what is this this specific museum that 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 you 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 don't see or, or you didn't see any of of, of um I, I don't know books and and, and television and, and everywhere and uh, and if i if i may ask another question um uh, and to follow daniela's uh, question um uh, is there a, a group or uh, um, any uh, conservative religious group that um, criticizes the, the, the museum um, from the right? Because, because I agree with, with Daniela that, that there is something um, secularizing in the historical contextualization, like, like um, in the text and the materials and, and so on. And, and 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 maybe maybe to 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 ignore um, the question of the divine authorship and and so on. Thank you. Yeah, it's such a, it's so fascinating to me that that you all would think of the words secularizing as describing that. Um, though now that that you say it, it reminds me that like I think a lot of people when Candida Moss and Joel Baden were were documenting what the Greens were up to. Um, there was there was sort of this speculation that it was going to be another literalist um, rendering of the Bible as like literal history as it happened. Um, and that's not what it wound up being in part because the Green family um, recruited um, biblical scholars um, who who were from across the religious spectrum uh, and secular scholars to advise them and formed like an international scholarly advisory board. Um, my reading of that is that it was for purposes of respectability um, because they were filing as a nonprofit. Um, and so one of the tax benefits, uh, it's, it always comes back to the money, I think, um, not always, but it's money is important uh, for these things, follow the money, right? Um, and so there is a sense where it is not what a lot of people expected, that it does not represent the Bible as literal history. It doesn't make an explicit argument that the Bible is has divine origins. Um, and, and somehow that makes it even more interesting to me anyway, because um, they started with a very evangelistic purpose and then molded it with the um, intervention uh, or recruiting of professional biblical scholars to sort of bring it up to snuff. Um, and so whereas like online on, on old museum videos, for example, it connects the cuneiform tablets to Abraham by it suggests that Abraham was a historical person who wrote these you know who might have written in these cuneiform tablets that's been excised from the execution in in the museum itself and so it is absolutely the case that there are some conservative Christians who have criticized the museum for not being explicitly evangelical. Um, and so they don't see you know Jesus where they want to see Jesus and so forth. Um, and yeah, so there it's it's when you when people set out to present the Bible in a way to please everyone, they're they're gonna fail, right? Like not everybody can be pleased because uh, because there is such a variety of of perspectives and ideologies around it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Uh, seven Thank you so much. Oklahoma. Thank you very I, much, Professor Hicks Kitan. I'm just delighted to have been able to participate. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. It was Thanks awesome. very much. Thank, Thank you. you all.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day and Thank Friday. You. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.